Aldershot, the Princess Royal arrives to inspect the 1st Battalion Canadian Scottish Regiment of British Columbia. Present on the occasion is the regimental mascot, Wallace, who has just returned to the strength of the unit. Ready for the journey home, the regiment will carry with it new company flags to replace those lost in action. The Canadian Scottish Pipe Band leads the march past, which is reviewed by their Colonel-in-Chief. From a ceremony in London St. Paul's Cathedral, a D-Day battalion parades through the city of London. Their destination is the mansion house, where the unit and its mascot are to be the guests of London's Lord Mayor at a banquet. While the Canadian regiment was in action on the Western Front, Wallace was left behind in England and cared for by the Royal Scots, with whom the Canadian Scottish is affiliated. The occasion commemorates the handing back of the nonchalant St. Bernard to Canadian Scottish strength. The Princess Royal, Colonel-in-Chief of both regiments, attends the function. Thanks is extended to the Royal Scots by former battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Henderson. We are very sensible of this service which the Royal Scots have rendered us, but we are not content merely to say thank you. And therefore, I would ask Your Royal Highness, as Colonel-in-Chief of the Royal Scots, graciously to accept from us, on their behalf, this plaque. Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal, addresses the gathering. In one sense, a four-footed animal, Wallace, the mascot of the Canadian Scottish, is the innocent reason of our meeting today. The Royal Scots have deemed it a great privilege to take care of the Canadian Scottish mascot. On behalf of all battalions of the Royal Scots, I now ask the tall Colonel Whiteman to accept this painting of Wallace. Colonel Whiteman, present O.C., Canadian Scottish, Canada's High Commissioner, and other dignitaries tie more strongly the bonds of friendship between the two regiments on the only occasion a dog has ever been guest of honor at a Lord Mayor's banquet. <laughs> At a Canadian port, freighters load up with Dominion wheat for Europe. Although the West harvested 115 million bushels fewer than last year, 419 millions are being exported without scraping the bottom of the bin. Canadian number one northern wheat is loaded for shipment to Germany. At the port of Hamburg, the shipments are unloaded. By diverting 15% of the wheat going to Britain, it is hoped that the German bread ration may be raised to one half of that available per person to the folks in the United Kingdom. With the assumption of control by the Allies comes the responsibility for combating starvation in the defeated country. Canadian granaries are therefore pouring in part of their output to keep Germany going until she can reap her own harvests. With this year's wheat export, six times the amount sent to Britain in 1939, Canadian bins are being rapidly lowered to stock the cupboards of Europe. At the Scottish airport of Prestwick arrive the first three British wives of Canadian servicemen to fly to Canada. High priority cases, their air passage is paid by their husbands. Passage is arranged for them aboard a Trans-Canada airline. Now they take off for their new home, the next stop, Dorval Airport, Montreal. Sunnybrook Military Hospital, which will be one of the world's great hospitals, is now under construction. For a wounded of two wars, it will have accommodation for 1,450 beds and will cost $11 million. At a dedication ceremony, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, Albert Matthews, presides. The grounds at Sunnybrook Park are a gift to the Dominion government by the City of Toronto. Before a large crowd, the cornerstone is laid by Corporal Topham, Victoria Cross winner, 
of the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. He's now on City Street. The young ex-medical orderly thus starts on its way to completion Canada's newest hospital for his comrades in arms. On parade at number one repat depot are a group of Chinese Canadians just in from the Far East. Specially trained for secret work behind Jap lines, they are interviewed by the Canadian Army newsreel. How do you fellas like this cold weather? Well, we don't. It's kind of cool here. I wish we could have some of that warm Indian weather. Oh, that's all right. Well, just what were you fellas doing down in India? We're all trained for duty uh, behind the Jap lines. I think uh, these boys uh, are all in um, wireless and signal work, except Corporal Lee here, who's uh, trained in demolition work. Yes, 12 of us were trained around Pune there for demolition work. They were going in for parachuting, but unfortunately, BJ Day came out. Now, well, just exactly what's this flash stand for? Well, that's a SEAC flash, the Southeast Asia Command. It's under Lord Louis Mountbatten. Well, I suppose since you fellows were intending to contact the Chinese behind the Jap lines, at least you all speak Chinese. Why, definitely. <laughs> What the Dickens does that mean? Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year! To keep the home fires burning in the billets of the CAOF in Germany, Axe and Saw take the place of Blanco and Bren. With transport overtaxed, it's practically impossible to get coal from the Ruhr mines. So to keep the dogs warm during a hard winter, the lads saw the cedar to frustrate the frigidity. Most of the forests in the Canadian sector are very young, but lads experienced in the bush of northern Ontario and B.C. pick out enough trees to fill up the fuel box. The discovery of a small sawmill gives the muscles a break as the axeman's output is sawed into king-size slabs. The falter's parade gives place to the woodpile patrol. Instead of swinging the lead, it's hoisting the hatchet, and nobody minds a bit. If the proper pile is kept filled, maybe Cookie will spring with an extra ration of Christmas turkey. Anyway, they can dream, can't they? All the way from sunny Spain, good St. Nicholas arrives at Amsterdam to gladden the hearts of the kiddies in the land of wooden shoes. Leaving his ship, the venerable saint mounts his white charger to lead a grand parade accompanied by his black peters. Many crippled, blind, or deaf kiddies are given the time of their lives thanks to the Canadian Army and the Netherlands Entertainment Committee who arranged the festivities. St. Nick's servants, the Black Peters, prefer to travel by pneumonia wagon, but then they're really Canucks in disguise. Many floats lend a carnival spirit to the occasion. from Spain is greeted at the town hall by the Burgomaster. From there, he leaves to attend a grand party where Canadian candy, cokes, and presents galore thrill the hearts of the lads and lassies. Lieutenant Colonel Gildy, representing the Canadian Army, and St. Nick honor the age-old tradition of drinking a toast in Spanish wine to a gay and happy liberation yuletide. capacity is Toronto's Varsity Stadium for the Dominion football final. An overnight snowfall gives 19,000 routers a chance for a competition of their own. On a frozen field, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers kick off to the Toronto Argonauts to open the game. The Argos, wearing white helmets, get the ball, and early in the first quarter, force the play into Winnipeg territory. The lads from the West just can't stand up to the speed and tactics of the double blues. Despite treacherous ground and stubborn resistance, it's Argos all the way from the first quarter. An end run lateral to Smiley gives them their first touchdown. As the timekeeper's stopwatch ticks off the quarters, the Argo score continues to pile up. Aerial tactics are a thing forgotten as Toronto concentrates on line bucks and end runs. So the Hogtowners' hysterical henchmen herald the end of full time 
which makes Argos Dominion Interprovincial champs for 1945. Argonauts 35, Winnipeg 0.